An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 5, June 3rd, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in our last session, we made an initial attempt to grasp the concept of dialectical negation rather more closely, that is, to explicate the notion of dialectical contradiction. From what we have said, I believe that it is now already possible to dispel one of the most common and vulgar conceptions regarding the dialectic. The idea that dialectic amounts to an egregious intellectualization of experience and thereby also to a dubiously harmonious understanding of the world. The argument goes something like this. If we do undertake with the dialectic to grasp everything that is a movement which arises from its contradictory character, if we submit everything that is to an intellectual schema and proceed as if the world in itself were utterly and entirely rational, then it is only on these assumptions that the world can be utterly and entirely constructed, as they say. But surely it is claimed this simply neglects the irrational aspect of things. As it happens in a recent essay on Eichendorf, I was able to point out a particular passage where Eichendorf, who himself hailed from the broad tradition of German idealism, had already charged the whole of post-Kantian philosophy, albeit in a rather summary way, with neglecting the darker and dissonant side of experience which can never be brought to full rational clarity. In this kind of thinking, therefore, the dialectic is subjected to the kind of charge which a certain German tradition, and not the most noble one in my opinion, has frequently raised against the French spirit, and specifically the spirit of Cartesian thought. The reflections we have already pursued should enable you to see how inappropriate this approach actually is, for the Hegelian philosophy in particular, by virtue of its dialectical character, that is, through its recognition of the moment of negativity, is opposed to the idea that everything can simply be entirely construed or constructed by ratio in a seamless and unbroken fashion. We could express this in a very pointed way and say that this philosophy is indeed an attempt to construe or construct reality, but precisely not as a seamless process. It attempts to do so in the breaks and fractures, and by virtue of the breaks and fractures harbored within reality itself. And if I may reveal to you here something of the fascination which the dialectic has always exercised upon me and my own intellectual efforts, and which it may also come to exercise upon some of you, I could almost say that this fascination springs from the way that dialectic somehow promises to square the, square the circle and not just promises to do so. For it does indeed claim to construe or construct precisely what cannot simply be exhausted in rationality, the non-identical, that which cannot itself be immediately construed, and thus to grasp the irrational by appeal to consciousness itself. I might also describe it thereby turning a Hegelian trope upon a much more modern pair of opposites as an attempt through ratio itself to rise above the opposition of the rational and the irrational. The negative, as I pointed out last time, is not some kind of supplement to the positive claims of thought, something counterposed to thought merely from the outside. Thus, the dialectical antithesis, the dialectical counterthesis, is not something posited externally in opposition to the initial thesis, something which thought must also address. Rather, the essence of the dialectical process lies in the way that the antithesis is derived from the thesis itself, in the way that what is what is comes to be grasped as both identical and non-identical with itself. It is precisely because this moment of negation is harbored in the specific thesis itself rather than counterposed to it from without, and precisely because in order to grasp these moments properly at all, we must now reduce or simplify things in advance, that the dialectic acquires that seriousness which I talked about in the last session.
Perhaps we could also capture this seriousness by saying that dialectical thinking is a form of thinking which does not define or determine the particular by reducing it to its class or type, by subsuming the particular beneath ever more inclusive concepts. Dialectical thinking is thus an attempt to grasp the particular not by resorting to classification, but rather by disclosing its own specific character, by trying to break it open, as it were, and thus reveal the opposition between particular and universal in the object of thought in each case. But subjective reasoning, and thus the supposedly all-governing rationality, is thereby also simultaneously exposed to its own opposite through the power of what is of the particular which cannot be exhausted without remainder, of the non-identical, of what is other, of what can properly be brought to consciousness, not by ra ratio sinatio, i.e. not by mere processes of inference, but only by attending or looking on. In this sense, therefore, dialectical thinking is not actually a rationalistic form of thought, insofar as it is critically directed both against the opaque and unarticulated and against the limitations of every individual rational p positing. So that our reflections may not remain too formal, something which could hardly be avoided at the very beginning, this might be a good place to say something about the debate over rationalism. This debate, ever since the controversies which arose in connection with the philosophy of Jacobi, and later in the week of Hegel's polemic against Schelling has continued to play a significant role in philosophical thought. Thus, on the one side, we have rational thought in the usual sense, which was rather derog derog derogatively described by Hegel as the philosophy of reflection, a mode of thought which appeals exclusively to the usual logical forms, definition, classification, inference, specific conceptual articulations and distinctions, and all such features, and accepts nothing as genuine knowledge which is not couched and developed in these forms. And on the other side, we have all those philosophies which are commonly and rather crudely characterized as a rationalist in character. The last major and significant representative of which was surely the philosophy of Henry Bergson. These philosophies basically defend a standpoint which Schelling was the first to formulate claiming that the merely finite knowledge produced by the understanding to express this in the language of German idealism does indeed remain merely external to its objects and reveals little of the actual life of reality. True knowledge, by contrast, is therefore one which sees the matter in question from within, as it were, instead of merely struggling to grasp and order it from without. But, in return, such knowledge appears to sacrifice those criteria of controllability, necessity, and universality, which Western scientific thought had come, had come since its Cartesian origins to regard as its highest criteria. I believe that this Hegelian talk and this dialectical talk in general about rising above certain fundamental oppositions, and this is indeed one of the most essential motifs of all dialectical thought itself, can be exemplified particularly well in relation to this so-called controversy over rationalism. A controversy which also finds its own place in Hegel's thought and is seriously addressed there. For on the one hand, Hegel furnishes a most emphatic critique of all merely mechanical or classificatory thought. And I believe I have already pointed out how the king of tabulating mentality which had effectively come to prevail in scientific thinking today, was already expressly attacked in a passage from the Phenomenology of Spirit. But on the other hand, he also fiercely attacks the kind of thought which is shot from a pistol, which aspires to grasp the absolute immediately, or at a stroke, something which his erstwhile friend and subsequent opponent Schelling appeared above all to embody at the time. And one could specifically interpret the phenomenology of spirit, this first outstanding major work of Hegel's, as an elaborate attempt to play each of these mutually contradictory moments off against the other, ultimately allowing them to, to criticize one another and be reunited on a higher level after all. What are we to say to all this? If we permit ourselves to consider this alternative between very different philosophical approaches, 
from a rather greater distance. On the one hand, we must acknowledge that thought does not actually possess any non-conceptual forms it can appeal to, that since we have acquired the sort of classificatory and definitional techniques that are developed in formal logic, we cannot simply leap out of these forms. And the claim of reason itself, and thus the very meaning of reason, in other words, the question regarding a truly rational order for the world, cannot be separated from this conception of reason as a conceptually perspicuous order of knowledge itself. And thus, in Hegelian philosophy as well, we discover that traditional logic, which Hegel of course criticized at its most central point, namely the principle of contradiction itself, is not simply displaced by dialectical logic. I believe it is extremely important, if you wish to understand the dialectic properly in this regard, for you to be quite clear that to think dialectically is not somehow to think in a non-logical way, or somehow to neglect the laws of logic. Rather, to think dialectically is to allow particular determinations to point beyond themselves whenever they come into contradiction with themselves, is thus to render them fluid through the application of logical categories. From this point of view, you can regard Hegel's entire logic as a kind of self-critique on the part of logical reason, the kind of critique which logic applies to itself. All of the traditional logical forms are retained within Hegel's logic. You will find them comprehensively discussed in the third major division of Hegel's so-called greater logic, in the logic of the concept. But at the same time, Hegel shows with, re with remarkable perceptiveness that while these structures of traditional logic in their usual form are indeed indispensable, they cannot constitute the whole of knowledge as long as they are taken in isolation or treated simply as so many particular uh, determinations. On the other hand, what is generally described as a rationalism also has a truth, truth moment of its own, for it is a repeated attempt to bring home to thought precisely what has been excised by thought itself, what has been lost to actual experience through a form of reason which dominates nature and itself alike. It is an attempt to do justice within philosophy to all that has been sacrificed to the process of enlightenment. Irrationalism as a whole, we might say, shows a tendency to acknowledge precisely what has been obscured in the ongoing process of European enlightenment and effectively vanquished by the dominance of reason. Everything that appears weaker or disempowered, everything merely existent that cannot be preserved in essential eternal forms and has therefore been dismissed as simply ephemeral. A constant tendency to vindicate a place for this even in the thought which had abjured it. And it is probably no accident and not merely a correlation prompted by the sociology of knowledge, but surely something profoundly connected with the essence of these irrationalist philosophies if they have tended to be reactionary or restorationist in character if for the moment I may use these words in a non-derogatory sense. In the sense, that is, that they somehow wish to lend a voice to all that has been sacrificed to history, though without thereby grasping the, necess the necessity of this sacrifice or this defeat within themselves. A rationalism thus reminds us that while human beings have been able to escape the blind compulsion of nature, only by means of rationality, by means of the thought which dominates nature, it would sink back into barbarism if they were to renounce this rationality. It is equally true that the process of the progressive rationalization of the world has also represented a process of progressive reification. Just as the reification of the world, the petrification of the world as an objectivity which is alien to human beings, on the one hand, and the growth of subjectivity on the other are not simply opposed to one another, are not simply contradictory, but are mutually correlated so that the more subjectivity there is in the world, the more reification there is as well. And it is precisely to this that irrationalism responds. Once thought has grasped this fatal structure, which is nothing but the dialectic of the process of enlightenment itself, it cannot simply abandon itself to one pole or the other.
and it certainly cannot seek the kind of wretched middle way that claims that we must somehow also find a place for the unconscious or the irrational alongside ratio itself. For an irrationality which is circumscribed in this way, merely tolerated by ratio and a kind of protected and natural reserve, has indeed thereby already been consigned to destruction, no longer possesses any real power, is indeed impotent. And the desire of dialectic is pre precisely to refuse such impotence in thought, to insist that thought must also harbor the possibility of its own realization within itself. The conclusion which Hegel draws from the alternative here is not to pit the alleged powers of the irrational against the powers of the rational, as people tend to do today within the dismal powers of the rational. Oh, sorry. As people tend to do today within the dismal administrative intellectual regimes of the present, which strive to bring everything, even the supposedly irrational, under conceptual bureaucratic categories, and thus nearly separate the class of rationality from that of irrationality. This wretched response is precisely what Hegel disdained, and he attempted instead to pursue what strikes me as the only possible path to take. By means of consciousness itself, by means of developed logical insight, or if you wish, by means of enlightenment, to call enlightenment itself by its proper name, to expose in enlightenment itself those moments of reification, alienation, and objectification by rational means, moments which can otherwise be exposed only in an external and therefore powerless fashion. The task, in other words, is to take up the moment of irrationality into thought of ratio itself as its own imminently contradictory element, rather than just playing this off against thought in an external way as an alternative worldview. Or you could also put it this way, to comprehend for its own part the irrationality which eludes reason itself, and also precisely through reason to extend the critique of reason far beyond that attempted by Kant, to show that reason insofar as it, as it necessarily entangles itself in contradictions <clears throat> repeatedly fails to do justice to what is not identical with itself, with what is not itself reason, and thus repeatedly miscarries. This is the very situation in which dialectical thought finds itself in relation to the controversy over rationalism, and it strikes me as symptomatic of the appalling vulgarization of dialectics today that someone like Lucas, who really ought to know better, has written, written a book entitled The Destruction of Reason, which should never have seen the light of day. Here he simply brands absolutely everything that looks like a rationalist philosophy, including Nietzsche, and also an, uh, an, under, an utterly misunderstood Freud with the cliched label of fascism without realizing that a dialectic that does not also effectively incorporate the moment which is opposed to cognitive ratio essentially forfeits its own character and reverts precisely to the kind of mechanistic thought which the great pioneers of dialectical philosophy had, to emphatically repu had so emphatically repudiated in the first place. With reference to one particular passage from Hegel, I would now like to show you how inappropriate the usual charge of intellectualism raised against dialectical thought actually is. But before I do so, I should also warn you once more against one misunderstanding which is so widespread that I cannot avoid drawing your attention to it, in spite of its primitive character. This is the misunderstanding which complains that philosophy intellectualizes the entire world when it employs the means of reason, as if for God's sake it could appeal to any other means. For naturally, thought in general, once it begins, must indeed be thought, cannot consist in mere protestations, in mere enthusiastic effusions, above that which is not itself thought. On the other hand, however, thought possesses the remarkable and deeply rooted capacity within itself to call this too by its real name, that is, to articulate that which is not itself thought. And here is the relevant passage, 
drawn once again from the preface to the phenomenology of spirit. Thus the life of God in divine cognition may well be spoken of as a disporting of love with itself, as theologians have indeed done. But this idea sinks into mere edification and even insip insipidity or insipidity <laughs> if it lacks the seriousness, the suffering, the patience, and the labor of the negative. Once again, in these remarks, you can feel the distinctive atmosphere, the very savor of dialectic in a very striking way. For in a formulation such as this, you see how the standard separation between the sphere of logic, which is marked by the concept of negation or negativity, and the sphere of real human experience, which is expressed by words such as seriousness, suffering, patience, labor, has been revoked. These categories are not strictly held apart from one another in Hegel, as they are in classificatory thought, and whenever Hegel comes to speak of contradiction, there too we encounter the sense in which we can suffer from a negative uh, condition or situation. This is because in Hegel, that labor of the concept in which we are said to suffer is also always a labor of the subject. In other words, is an activity and achievement of human beings engaged in knowing. And this human activity and achievement involves not only the intellectual sphere, which has been divorced <coughs> from the concrete content, but also the whole of experience. One could almost say the whole history of humanity so that every process of thought is also always a question of suffering or of happiness. And this whole separation of thought from happiness or of thought from suffering, for the dimension of happiness and of suffering is indeed a single dimension, must be revoked by thinking which is fully aware of its own historical conditions. Conditions which are comprised in the in the totality. In my little book on Hegel, I once declared that Hegelian philosophy is indeed life repeated, as it were, that in this philosophy we actually do have our life again in the many colored show of things. What I wanted to say was that the thought process presented in Hegel's philosophy as a whole is indeed an entirely logical process, but at the same time a process which, <clears throat> which by virtue of its own logical character, also points beyond abstract thought and is nourished on forms of experience with which we are all familiar. And thus, if one could say that Kant's philosophy represents an impressive attempt to salvage ontology precisely on the basis of nominalism, we should have to recognize that all of the distress and dissatisfaction occasioned by the loss of metaphysical meaning also found its way into the logical exertions which Kant was obliged to undertake that this distress and dissatisfaction would indeed be a condition of those logical exertions. And perhaps I can clarify my own attempts at dialectical thinking in the following way. For the essential task here, as I see it, is not to logis log logicize language as the positivists want to do, but rather to bring logic to speak. And this precisely captures Hegel's intention namely that happiness and suffering may be revealed as an imminent condition, as an imminent content of thought itself, that thought and life alike may be redefined and reinterpreted, that this task be undertaken with all possible rigor and seriousness. And it is, of course, precisely this aspect which is completely misunderstood as mere intellectualism in the standard hostility of dialectical thought. But in terms of traditional and now exhausted thought, the dialectic naturally finds itself caught between Scylla and Charybdis. Thus, on the one hand, it is reproached for being unduly intellectualist, for logicizing the supposedly irrational aspects of experience. On the other hand, every common or garden logician will naturally respond to remarks like Hegel's by saying, well, this is just emotional talk. What has thought got to do with all this seriousness, pain, labor, or suffering in general? These are completely different categories. But the essence of dialectic lies precisely in this, 
that it tries by means of thought itself to undo the, undo that separation of spheres, which is preeminently reflected in the common or garden cliché of the three faculties of thinking, feeling, and willing. And the celebrated notion of the unity of theory and praxis itself is the only is sorry is only the highest expression of this attempted revocation, if you like which cannot, of course, imply a mere restitution or restoration of what was once single and undivided. It points rather to an imminent process of reunif reunification in and through separation of what has been divided. But I shall continue with the rest of the passage we have been discussing. In itself, that life, the life of God, is indeed one of untroubled equality and unity with itself, for which otherness and alienation and the overcoming of alienation are the serious matters. But this in itself is abstract universality in which the nature of the divine life to be for itself, and so too the self-movement of the form, are altogether left out of account. I should like to take this opportunity to clarify one or two particular expressions which are indispensable to an understanding of Hegel. And I cannot avoid pointing out here that these concepts which are by no means easy to grasp in their precise logical meaning in Hegel, have nonetheless found their way into everyday language, although the actual influence or authority exerted by a philosophy and the general intelligibility or accessibility of that philosophy obviously have no direct relationship with one another. I am talking about the concepts of being in itself, being for itself, and being in and for itself. Even if we have never heard of Hegel or the dialectic, we often say things like, in itself, that's true, or that's true in and for itself, without expressly reflecting that in using such an expression, we are already involved in a process. And while we may know how this process begins, it is hard to see exactly where it will take us. To talk about something in itself is to talk about something insofar as it is such and such, is not yet reflected within itself. <clears throat> the concept of being for itself is also relatively easy to understand if you take it quite literally. Thus, something for itself here not only means something separated or split off from the whole, although this aspect of separation plays a very important part here, but also suggests what it does when we say, for example, that in himself this person is a scoundrel, before himself, in his own eyes, is a decent and upstanding human being. That is, he doesn't reflect on what he is. He may not even realize his own untrustworthiness, but regards himself, through narcissism, as the psychologists would say, as a wonderful human being. Thus, for himself, he is a wonderful person, but in himself he is still a scoundrel, i.e. in terms of his objective behavior as this is actually revealed in his social role or conduct. The Hegelian philosophy, which indeed essentially addresses, like all dialectic, the way in which subject and object, the subjective and the objective, are also separated from one another, undertakes specifically to expose and explore this difference between being in itself and being for itself, although there are two paths it can take in this regard. Thus, in the logic, the path leads from being in itself through being for itself, and ultimately to being in and for itself. Whereas in the phenomenology, one might say that the opposite path is pursued, as we begin from subjectivity, which, which then arrives at consciousness of itself, or being for itself. And solely through this consciousness, and all of the reflection, involved in it finally arrives at being in itself and being in and for itself. This contrast between being in itself and being for itself is intended with such seriousness that we can already recognize the really decisive objective motive. <clears throat> the objective dimension at work here. The thought that human beings and Hegelian philosophy is in its origins a humanistic philosophy are not identical with themselves in the function which they objectively fulfill in society, and that their social role, to use a modern expression, or their being in itself diverges from the consciousness which they have of themselves, or their being for itself. <clears throat> 
And this disparity, this non-identity between human beings and their own world, which is indeed by no means yet their own, is itself the ground of that deremption, that suffering, that negativity, which, as I have already suggested to you, can only be overcome through the labor, the patience, the seriousness, the exertion of the concept. <coughs> Thus you can see how the logical metaphysical conception of Hegel is indeed directly associated with such emotionally charged expressions as seriousness, and so on, expressions which at least are saturated in actual human experience. Thus, I doubt if you will now be that surprised if I challenge so much of your preconceived image of Hegel, and perhaps even shock some of you, when I say that the celebrated triadic schema of thesis, antithesis, and, and synthesis actually plays nothing like the role in Hegel's philosophy, which it is commonly believed to do. And I would be more than happy if I could succeed here from a whole variety of angles, in awakening a concept of dialectic which is liberated from the automatic responses typically encouraged in the context of examination questions. Of course, there's also something in all that, but as long as you imagine that we must have a thesis, a claim, a proposition, which we then externally confront with the opposite, before finally combining them both in a similar more or less external fashion, as long as you think in this way, then you will actually entertain nothing but the most external conception of dialectic. The seriousness of the dialectic springs precisely from the fact that it is not some such external intellectual game of, oh sorry, game of juggling contradictions. For the contradiction itself springs from the thesis itself and shows itself as such only because the speculative proposition itself is always at once true and false. And indeed, Hegel himself mounted the most vigorous criticism of the standard manipulation of the concept of dialectic in terms of this triadic schema. The most important thing for you here is to learn what it really means to confront reality in a dialectical spirit, rather than in asking mechanically after the relevant thesis, antithesis, and synthesis in every possible context. And I would also, and I should also confess right now that I always find the word synthesis profoundly suspect. And if I understand you rightly, I feel that most of you will also experience a certain sense of horror at the concept of synthesis. The passage in Hegel which relates specifically to this issue and which I would like to read to you now runs as follows. Of course, the triadic form must not be regarded as scientific when it is reduced to a lifeless schema, a mere shadow, and when scientific organization is degraded into a table of terms. Kant rediscovered this triadic form, of, form by instinct, but in his work it was still lifeless and uncomprehended. Since then it has, however, been raised to its absolute significance, and with it the true form and its true content, content has been presented, so that the concept of science has emerged. You can see how this already suggests a critique of the kind of tabulating thought which in the era of the administered world today has indeed almost become the universal form of science in general a form of thought against which language itself now obviously occupies a hopelessly defensive position. Under no circumstances, therefore, must dialectical thought even tempt us into forcing the objects of experience into such a schema. For to think dialectically is precisely to take individual objects as they are, to do so genuinely rather than in some limiting way, not to limit them or subsume them under their next highest concept but to try and do justice to the life that prevails in the individual thing itself, that prevails in the individual concept itself, the life that was indeed regarded by Hegel as something contradictory, as something antagonistic in character. Hegel had already clearly recognized the danger that dialectic can, can degenerate into a mechanical device. Although this is often what he was himself, been, what he has himself been accused of encouraging, and anyone who takes the actual trouble to study Hegel's major works, and especially the phenomenology of spirit, will find how little of this mechanical aspect is to be found here. <clears throat> 
I shall like to conclude for today with the following excellent formulation from Hegel. The knack of this kind of wisdom, the dialectic as an external method, is as quickly learned as it is easy to practice. Once familiar, the repetition of it becomes as insufferable as the, re as the repletion of a conjuring trick already seen through. If I, may give you, if I may give this thought a somewhat broader twist, it is this. Where philosophy itself is concerned, all those claims to knowledge which can be foreseen from the moment that thought begins and thus inspire the reaction we know that already, which are fundamentally contained in advance within the generic concept that lies above them, are essentially worthless, and it may be regarded as an index of the truth, or an index very a falsi. Something thought is capable of encountering something which is not self-evidently contained in the thought at the moment when it arises. <clears throat> which does not simply emerge from it all at once. There is no truth, one might almost say, which in this sense could be foreseen on the basis of the formulated thought, and it is probably the surest symptom of the appalling degeneration to which dialectic is exposed today, under the name of diamat, of the way it has now reverted to pure untruth, that ready-made phrases and slogans do spring forth as if in a conjuring trick, and enable us to judge and subsume everything without undertaking the labor and exertion of the concept which is demanded by the dialectic. We could also express this by saying that dialectic has here forgotten what it intrinsically and essentially is. In other words, it has ceased here to be a critical theory and has turned into a merely mechanical process of, subs of subsumption. No form of thinking is immune to this. Even the principle of dialectic, opposed as it is to mechanical thinking, can revert to a conceptual me mechanism once it is no longer genuinely dialectical. That is, once it forfeits intimate contact with its object and ceases to respond carefully and closely to that object. In short, nothing guarantees that dialectic itself cannot in turn become ideology.